In the last lecture, we learned that when a user is successfully logged into the application, in response, we are going to send an access token. And for the access token, we are going to generate a JSON web token. You can also call it as JWT in short. And this token will be used as an identity for the logged in user. A JSON web token is an open standard that defines a compact and self-contained way for securely transmitting information between parties as a JSON object. And this information can be verified and trusted because the token is digitally signed. Now, this definition might not explain what JWT is, but I'm going to explain to you in detail what JWT is and how it is created. JSON web token are stateless solution for authentication. That means no session state is stored on the server and that is perfect for RESTful APIs like the one which we are building with NestJS. The reason for that is, as we have learned before, the RESTful API should always be stateless. There are also alternatives to JWT. We can also use sessions for storing the user logged in state on the server, but that does not follow the principle of RESTful API, which says that the RESTful API should be stateless. And that's why we are opting for a solution like JWT, which is stateless. Now, before we learn about JWT in depth, let's first understand how authentication and authorization works with JWT. And let's start with authentication. So here we have a client and a server. The server is where our NestJS application is hosted. And the client can be anything from where we are making requests to this web API application. A client can be a browser, a mobile app, or a tool like Postman. Now, assuming that we already have some user in the database, when a user tries to log into our application, he sends a login request. The login request is a POST request, and with that POST request, we need to send a username or email and password in order to authenticate the user. So, in the request body, we are going to have an email or a username and the password. Now on the server, the web application will check if the user exists and the password provided for that user is a correct match or not. So once the request is received on the server, the web application is going to fetch the user information based on the email or the username from the database. So it is going to check if with that email or username, a user already exists in the user table or not. And if a user exists, if the password provided during login, if it matches or not. If the user exists and if his password is correct, a unique JSON web token is generated using a secret key stored on the server. And this secret key, it is defined by the application developer. And this secret key is stored on the server where the application is running. So in our next lecture, when we will start working on generating a JWT, there you will see that we are also creating a secret key which will then be used in order to generate a JSON web token. So this secret key is created by the developer and it is present on the server. And using this secret key, a JSON web token is generated. And we will understand that in a bit. Also, the generated JSON web token itself is a string. It is a base64 encoded string and it looks something like this. We will understand more about JWT in a bit in this lecture. Now, after successful login, the server is going to send the JWT in the response back to the client. On the client, this JWT will be stored either in the cookies or in the local storage. So this JWT, which is stored on the client, will act like an identity proof for the logged in user. And now, whenever the user tries to access a protected route with the request, the JWT will be sent in the request header to validate the user. If the user is an authenticated user, he will get access to the protected route. Otherwise, his access will be denied. The JWT sent with the request will be used for identifying and validating the user. And this is how a user is authenticated and logged into the application without storing any state on the server. So the server does not know which user is logged in. But of course, the user knows that he is logged in because he has a valid JSON web token. So remember that a user is logged in as soon as he gets a valid JSON web token from the server. 
and this process is completely stateless because the server sends the JWT but it does not store it. JWT is stored on the client. So this is how authentication works with JWT. Now let's see how authorization works with JWT. So once the user is logged in, each time he tries to access a protected route, for example, once a user is logged in, if he tries to access his user profile, this user profile will be a protected route. Only a logged in user should be able to access his profile. So when a user is logged in and when he tries to access a protected resource, a protected route with the request, the JWT should also be attached with that request and sent to the server. And this JWT, this token, this will act as an identity proof for the user to get access to the protected resource. Now, once the request is received on the server by the web API application, it verifies if the JWT is valid or not. And we will learn how this verification works in a bit. Now, if the token is valid, then the requested data will be sent back to the client. But if the token is not valid, then the user will get access denied response. And also, as long as the user is logged in, this is how the request response will work each time the user makes a request to the protected route. So this is how the authorization works with JWT. For the authorization, the JSON web token is sent with each request which the client makes in order to access a protected route. And that JSON web token is then verified on the server. If it is valid, the user will get access to the protected route. But if it is invalid, the access will be denied for that user. Now, the important point to note here is that all this request and response should happen using HTTPS protocol. That means the request should be sent with a secure and encrypted HTTPS protocol. And this is important to avoid anyone getting access to the password or JWT from the request. Only then we will have a really secure system. However, it is not mandatory to use HTTPS protocol. But if you want a secure connection between client and server so that no one can tap into the request and access sensitive data sent with the request, you should use HTTPS protocol. And this is it. This basic knowledge is all you need to know in order to understand how authentication and authorization works with JWT. Now we are going to understand how does JWT works and what it consists of. So a JSON web token looks something like this. A JSON web token is a base 64 encoded string and it consists of three parts, the header, the payload and the signature. Each part is separated with a dot. As you can see in this base 64 string, we have two dots. The first dot is here and the second dot is here. So these two dots, they act as a separator. Now, a JSON web token, as I mentioned, it consists of three parts. The first part is the header. The header is a base 64 encoded string. And when you decode that string, it will look something like this. A header basically contains the metadata about the token itself. For example, what algorithm is used for encoding the header to base 64 string and what type of token it is. In this example, it is a JWT token. The second part of the JWT string is the payload. So this purple string, which you see here, it is the payload of the JWT. The payload is the data that we want to encode into the token. So here you see, in order to create a payload for this JSON web token, we are using three properties. The sub, which stores a unique ID. This unique ID can be the user ID or the timestamp at which that user was created. Then here, we also have another property called name. Now here you can also use other property like email, username, etc. So that property will also be used for creating the payload. Here we are taking an example of name. So here using the name of the user, we are creating a payload. Then here we also have IAT, which stands for issue debt. That means at what time the JSON web token was issued. We can also have other properties in payload like expires at, at what time the JWT will expire. We can also have audience and issuer. 
so the second part of the jwt it is basically the payload and this payload is defined by us developers now the more data you encode in the payload the bigger the jwt will be also whatever you encode in the payload that can be easily decoded so you need to make sure that you do not use any sensitive data in the payload for example you should not use the password in the payload because a payload can be easily decoded and after decoding anyone can see the plain password okay so the header and the payload these are the two parts that are just plain text that will get encoded but they will not be encrypted so anyone will be able to decode them and read them and that's why we should not store any sensitive information in payload or header now the third and most important part is signature this signature is the one which makes jwt more secure the signature consists of header and payload encoded in base 64 string so you can see this signature consists of the same header but encoded in base 64 string so this first part then it also has the payload encoded to base 64 string that means the second part and then it also uses a secret key and combining all these three together it creates a signature okay so remember that a signature consists of header payload and the secret key which is stored on the server so in the last slide we learned that a secret key is something which is created by the developer and it is stored on the server so the signature of the jwt is created using that secret key combined with header and payload encoded to base 64 string and this process is called as signing the json web token let's learn how this signing process works so as we learned a jwt consists of header payload and signature now during the signing process what happens is jwt takes the header and the payload and it also takes the secret key which is stored on the server to create a unique signature now this header it is defined by the jwt algorithm the payload we provide when we are trying to generate a jwt and the secret key is already present on the server so we also use this secret key to create the jwt so during the jwt generation first the header payload and secret is used to create a signature now this signature combined with header and payload again creates a jwt which looks like this okay so how do we create a jwt when we are creating a jwt at that time we have to provide the payload for creating that jwt the header we don't need to specify anything for this because it will be taken care by the jwt function which we are using and the secret key is already present on the server so combining these three we create a signature and that signature combined with the same header and payload creates a jwt i hope this is clear now let's understand how this jwt is verified when a logged in user tries to access a protected route so again from the client let's say a logged in user is trying to access a protected route the logged in user is trying to access his profile data with this request the user is going to send the jwt which he received during the login with the request now when this request is received on the server the server is going to validate this jwt in other words the server will verify that no one has tempered with the jwt before the request has been received on the server that means it checks that no one has either altered the header or the payload of the jwt now how does this verification works so as we learned a json web token it consists of three parts header signature and the payload so what the server does is what our web application will do is it will extract the header and the payload from the jwt the secret key it is already stored on the server so our web application will now combine this header and the payload extracted from the jwt and combine it with the secret key stored on the server to generate a test signature so 
this signature is the original signature which was created when the JWT was generated. And now we are creating a test signature using the header and the payload from that original JWT and the secret key which is stored on the server. Now, if the original signature, if it is equal to the test signature, that means the JWT is valid. So in that case, the server will allow the user to access the protected route. But if the original signature is not equal to the test signature, that means someone has tempered with the JWT and the JWT is not valid and that's why the server will not allow the user to access the protected route. The access will be denied. And this is the complete process of how authorization works and how the JWT is verified on the server. It is this implementation which makes JWT simple but extremely powerful. So in summary, without the secret key which is stored on the server, no one will be able to manipulate the JSON web token to generate a valid token because a valid JSON web token cannot be created without the secret key. So I hope now you understand what is JWT, how a JWT is created and how a JWT is verified on the server. Also, how a JWT can be used for authorizing a logged in user to access protected routes. Now, we are not going to create a JWT algorithm by ourselves. Instead, we will use a NestJS package to generate a JWT for us and we will send that JWT in the response. And we will start doing that from our next lecture. So in next couple of lectures, we will learn how to generate a JWT using a NestJS package and send it in the response after a successful user login. So this is all from this lecture. If you have any questions from this lecture, then feel free to ask it. Thank you for listening and have a great day.